All right. Hello, hello. Hi, Ray. How you doing? You guys hear me? Yeah. Yep. Hello. Hey, Jeff. Nice haircut, Jeff. Long time. Yeah. Hey, Patty. Hey, Valerie. <laughs> Happy birthday, Gracie. <laughs> where is she? Gracie, where are you? <laughs> Gracie, is she two or three? What the bleep? Four years have gone by. Four years. Wow. <laughs> Wow, 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 wow. Thank you. Feel free, free to unmute yourselves if you want to say hello before we start. Hey, Valerie, it's so good to see you. Thank you. Good to and see Patty, you. And Patty and Jeff. Jeff, have you been traveling? No, I haven't. I've been really uh, staying home. All right. Just... I'm going to make a quick trip to Gloucester next week for a few days. But uh, basically, no big trips. Um, in a second, I'm having a problem with my sound here. Okay. Not sure why. You are not muted. Hmm. Say hello again. I can't hear you. I wonder, can everyone else hear Jeff? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. I can't hear you guys. I've plugged in, I have this new program that is like helping us with the quality of the image. Yeah. And I'm afraid to take it out. <sighs> I've been attacked by spiders, nothing to worry about. <laughs> Little Costa, Costa Rican reality here. Yeah, yeah. Let me uh, try this and see. Test one, two, say hello again. Oh, uh, hello. Now your image is Frozen. Let's see if you come back. Ray, are you there? There you are. I don't think. Okay, I'm going to apologize. I don't have sound. I'm not receiving sound. So, any questions, any hellos and stuff, please put them in the chat box. I just got to say that I'm really happy to see you guys. Very happy to be here. Very happy you guys are here. And setting up this new little camera equipment. And to be honest, it's uh, Nina is becoming more and more computer suave. So she got this new um, software that allows us to talk through a camera rather through the computer. We're hoping to make our quality overall better. Welcome, Kim. Welcome, Bridget. Bridget. Hey, Bridget Leroy. Leroy. Don't call me Leroy. Leroy. Mademoiselle <laughs> Leroy. I have no sound. I was just telling everyone. Uh, so anything on the chat box, any questions, please put in the chat box, any comments. I don't have sound. Yeah, people can hear me. I can't hear people. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Any noise? Anything? All right. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome to Dharma Night, Dharma Talk. I'm really happy to be here. Very, I'm honored to be here. I feel that. Let's start with the meditation and then we'll dive into a little bit into our into our talk and exploration of spiritual paths, I would say. So I invite you to find a comfortable seat. And gently, as you press down through your sits bones, lift your rib cage away from your pelvic floor, tuck your chin back and lengthen up through the crown of your head. Invite the tip of your tongue to your upper palate and a gentle smile at the edges of your lips, the edges of your eyes. Now I invite you to close your eyes and bring your attention inward. Take a moment to return. 
inside, returning to the point of origin. And as you are inside with your eyes closed to the outside world, just take a moment and notice where you're at right now. Check in with yourself. It's almost like saying, hey, dear self, I'm home. I've come to check in and kind of feel if you're feeling the echo of any What's the echo you're in? What was the previous things that were happening in the day? You're feeling you're in the echo of happiness or is there any frustration or is there any fear? Or is there any anger? Is there any excitement, sweetness? Just notice and, and right there noticing that, remember that what we're feeling, what we're living resonates inside us for quite a while. Notice your breath, and as you inhale, feel that you're inviting an inhalation right down the center core of your body all the way to your pelvic bowl. Exhale, maybe with a sigh, you can say, ha. Ah. Let it all go, release. Ah. With your next inhalation, invite your hands to your heart. I invite the winds of the south to bring serpent to, to help us shed our skin and let go of the past. I invite the winds of the west to bring Otorongo so we can start thinking with a mind that is not informed by fear. I invite the winds of the north to bring hummingbirds who are so plexus is filled with sweetness and nectar of life. I invite the East to bring a condor so we can all come into this place of discernment to know the ways of rising above and seeing the greater picture. Feeling Mother Earth under my feet, I am grateful, 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 grateful to Mother Earth. I'm feeling sun and the moon above me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. With your hands to your heart, bow your chin to your heart and thank yourself for everything that you do for your healing or your and your evolution. And if you wish to, only if you wish to, you can bow deeper to any god or a goddess, any saint, an avatar. And gently inhale and rise and open your eyes. Ooh. Welcome, welcome. Thanks for being here, guys. And I see uh, several of you, we've been working together for a while. So thanks for being here. I want to talk a little bit about, I was invited to a uh, summit that's called the Flow Summit that's going to be uh, uh, broadcasted through Europe. And I was invited to talk about flow. So uh, I, I, I was really, <laughs> I was really inspired because they asked me if I was interested to talk about flow. And so flow in Greek is Roy, and my name is Ray, and this great philosopher Heraclitus who, and Ray is, is the way to, to use the verb, something that flows is something that Ray. So <laughs> Heraclitus, uh, the ancient Greek philosopher, wrote about 500 uh, BC, around 500 to 600 BC. I don't remember the exact dates of his life, but it was around there when he was writing. And he was the great guy that said, everything flows. And everything in life, he realized close to Democritus, who was the great uh, nuclear scientist of ancient Greece. They realized that everything is moving, although we're holding something in our hands, it is really made of all these molecules and electrons and that are spinning around protons and everything is constantly moving. And along with that, everything psychological and everything, personal relationships, age, views, everything is constantly in a, in a flux, in a flow. If it wasn't, we'd all be in a phrase frame, frame would be like freeze frame, would be like, that would be the world. And there wouldn't be any unfolding, we would be like, yeah. I guess we would be like a poster of sorts. We wouldn't be at all. 
So the fact that things are moving is what creates life itself. It creates electricity in the body, what moves chemicals. The fact that things are moving uh, allows us and affords us everything, all the, all the components to create so much different kind of life. Uh, so I'm inspired and I'll share with you guys uh, the summit flow when it's aired. I'm going to send it out when they send me my link and uh, I'll send it to you guys so you can see it. Um, the talk itself, but I'll just talk a little bit about it because we've already been talking about it. We like everything that is shamanic is flow. Shamans heal because they know that when I arrived there and I said, hey, I have stage four cancer they knew that that's not something that's permanent. Yes, it could have been increasing and going down that direction, but that means the fact that it could change, that it was changing, it meant that it's changeable. And things don't have only one direction. So they helped me make some changes within myself to change the direction of where that was headed. So we changed those uh, molecules and those cells from cancer cells to not be cancer cells. Um, so everything is always flowing. Everything is always flowing. And that is something that really comes into our psychology a lot, because one of the things that the part of the brain, our narrator wants and loves is stability. Anyone here loves stability? Should do this? Yeah. It's like, you won't even be bothered. Of course we do. We don't even want to shake our hand about it. It's a given. And guess what there isn't when there is total flux and flow, when everything constantly flows, that means there is no stability. That means that there's ever, ever uh, changing reality. So I, I'm going to just really focus and say just like the bullet points of what I talked about being inspired and especially because this was headed to Greece, to Europe. I put a lot of Greek in there uh, and it was this whole like, festival of Greek. I was so happy to speak all my words. You guys have heard the words. Um, I want to say that the idea is that the understanding of all the people of martial artists and, and, uh, and acupuncturists who are the Taoists, the yogis and the shamans uh, are all talking about everything flowing. They're talking about an energy that moves constantly. And actually they're also saying what also seeing all three of these ancient technologies and arts are seeing uh, what um, what Hippocrates, the ancient Greek doctor, said, who said, if something moves, it thrives, and if something remains still, it dies. Uh, so here we come with Kung Fu, everything that's moving thrives. Uh, here we come with yoga, right? and those shamanic rattles rattling, we move the energy. And the more we move the energy, the more we're finding ourselves in the place of, uh, of well-being. Even Harvard Medical studying HRV, heart rate variability, the highest heart rate, the higher our heart rate variability is, the healthier we are, the higher the height heart rate variability is, the more aware and awakened we are to what is happening around us. And the more people want to feel that, and the more people want to match our heart rate. So the lower heart rate variability we have, the lower our ability is to comprehend what is happening. So here we go. Life itself wants constant change. And the ego narrator, the person that in that voice inside us that describes our voice, our, our life rather, doesn't want any change. If things could be totally still and the same every day, that would be really, really a nice, uh, nice good news for the narrator. The yogis move the energy through the postures and the breathing. The Kung Fu people, obviously through Kung Fu, Tai Chi, Qigong, and with using needles to move the electricity in different ways. And the shamans, they rattle and feather and blow and keep on constantly moving all that. So that, I, I won't go further than the bullet points because many of you have been with me and we've been studying all this. So we've, you know what I'm talking about and I'll try not to repeat it, but I will touch a couple, couple points and then I will also uh, open it up to questions. 
I think one of the biggest points that has been something that I have witnessed in myself and I've witnessed in literally thousands of other people working out of Kripalu and traveling uh, through the world to uh, different yoga centers, et cetera, and just invited in different yoga, uh, different yoga studios is that the hardest part of, of this thing called evolution and spiritual evolving is the fact that we do not want to change that, that part of the narrative who likes stability, who likes to have a routine, a coffee every morning. I love my coffee. It's like, there's one thing that gets me out of bed at 5.25 a.m. is the fact that I know that I'm going to live that moment again, that I'm going to come in with two mugs of coffee and see everyone's smiling. You guys know our love for coffee and just sip the coffee for one hour looking outside the window to like kind of get the day started. And so I have people that, that come and we like work together to make some changes happen. And it's just one of the things that I've really found out is that in essence, most people will say if they would speak exactly what they're saying, it's like, I don't want to change. I want things to change around me. It's like, so there's this person that upsets me and there's that situation that saddens me and there's that thing at work that I'm not liking and there's these other people in the neighborhood that could be different. So, so the narrator, the ego, as you say, uh, or the narrator, uh, that part of the self uh, would like things to change. And the idea is, and again, what I found uh, to be incredibly, what is impossible is things won't change because we can't change someone else. But if we are bothered by things, there's two ways to go about it. First of all, radically change it, radically change the scenery that we are in, right? And there's this one saying that says that you can never heal in the same place that you got diseased. Like when, you, when you're in a place and you, you receive the disease, that the part of the disease is the place where it happened. And that for me was the hugest gift that I somehow mustered up the energy and when I was living in Greece at 39, 40 years old already, all my life and all my, my career and my home, I had just finished paying off my house, like my car, my, my motorcycle, I was happy. And then all of a sudden, I could not have any of that. And, and I was really happy to understand that, to have gotten that oracle reading from the Oracle of Delphi. Um, and just as a parenthesis, I'll put it there. When I was when I was diagnosed, I left and left for a week out of Athens. I had many breakdowns. I went to my favorite place in the world, which is the, the Oracle of Delphi. When we open the trips to Greece again, that's a place I'm going to invite everyone to come. We should all come. Uh, and, and the Oracle was the place where all the kings, right, and queens would go when they had big decisions to make. Should we go to war with the Persians? What are we going to do with the Romans? It's like big life and death uh, uh, stuff, then we needed to uh, consult the Oracle. So I did, I went to the Oracle, Greece is a little bit, not like the States, a little bit more like Costa Rica, where uh, I saw there was a hole in the fence. So I went at night, don't tell anyone, I went at night under the, the hole <laughs> into the ancient site and sat where the Oracle would sit, right under the moon. Oh, Jeff, you would love that place. You would love that place. We'll, we'll, we'll set up an illegal meditation night. <laughs> we'll all crawl under that fence. Uh, and I sat in meditation and the answer I said is like, am I dying? What should I do? And uh, you've been there. Awesome, Dilla. Yeah, it's magical, isn't it? The air, the, the, the vibration of Delphi is just incredible. Um, so I sat in meditation and, and, and I heard this uh, oracle come into my head and say, he who travels, uh, he who travels uh, heals, uh, and he who travels dies learning. So I realized that one of my biggest fears and breakdowns that I had when I was diagnosed is the fact that I hadn't learned about what I wanted to learn the most. Since I was 16 years old, I wanted when I was when I was 16 till when I was 20 years old, I wanted to be a shaman. I read all of Carlos Castaneda books. I wanted to know 
what this reality is made of. I was kept on saying, what's behind the scaffolding? What's holding up the sun? What's moving this reality? Where is our spirit? Where's our psyche? How can I know when energy is moving or when it's stagnated? How can I heal people? That really fascinated me. But by the time I was 19, I got my first motorcycle. Then I started dating. And that fascinated me more. The mundane world got my full attention. Now that my 19-year-old son is with me, uh, and I'm, I'm a practicing father again in his last three months, it's so nice that he's moved here with us. Uh, now I remember exactly why. It's just fascinating. That world outside is just like absolutely fascinating for people that age. So my motorcycle, the bars, uh, and then photography, it all became all that world. Uh, but there I was, you know, dying uh, 19 years later after that. And I had not really found out how this energy of life works. And I didn't really find out how much power I had inside me. And that felt really bad. That, that, that like, bad taste that I had in my mouth is that I hadn't done one of the things that I felt would really fascinate me. And I would die without knowing. So when the uh, Oracle said he who dies, he who, he who uh, travels, uh, lives, or dies learning, I'm like, I'll take either one. I'm either going to go and I can find the shamans that are going to move this energy and, and heal me, or if anything, I'm going to learn a lot more. And when I die, I will die knowing. So check. <laughs> now I know. <laughs> There's a lot I know. So I'm a lot more ready to die than I used to be when I was 40. Um, and, um, and now I'm more engaged with life than uh, a lot more engaged with life than I was when I was 40. So I'm good. The essence is to, as I left this place, I left everything behind me. So change, while it's constantly happening, our mind clenches on to a few things and it holds them as a point of reference for reality. And it's important. The mind needs to have points of reference in reality. And that's where friendships are, friendships are important. That's why a marriage is important. That's why our dog is important. That's why the friends that we have and or the, some relatives, uh, even though sometimes we'll all go to uh, Thanksgiving and we know it's not going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> I mean, sometimes it is. <laughs> but a lot of times it's upsetting. And Anyone else? Or is it only me? I don't want to be just negative about thanksgiving but a lot of times we go and it's just like Arr. but even seeing my uncle who always makes me feel bad gives me a point of reference and i still know who i am and who i am not even if i'm taking that even i'm saying i'm not that that my uncle thinks when i meet him it's it helps us stabilize ourselves now and that's the most important thing here is like when i left the country that I lived in, my, my country, that's what I consider my country, Greece, that's where I lived all of my life, with a backup, with a backpack, and no backup, just a backpack, I had no point of reference left. I went to a country, and, and funny enough, I'm sure with all you guys, you know, you're hearing me speak, you've seen my handouts, etc. When I first arrived in the States in 2004, I wasn't speaking like I speak now. I mean, yes, my dad's American and I kind of like grew up a little bit with it, but I lived in a country and my mother's Greek and I lived in a country where I always spoke another language. Uh, and I was only, you know, now I'm beginning to really actively speak everyday English or else I spoke Greek all my entire life. So there was this point of reference of language that was gone, point of reference of the places that I used to go to, point of reference, all my points of references were gone. And guess what happened? Like myself, that I was plugging in to know my identity by these points of references, so did my cancer. And as those points of references plugged into who I was and helped me be who I was, they also had helped me and led me to the place where I was, Ray, that had cancer and 90 days to live. So by taking out all that, I, yes, on one hand, I, I lost, I, I, I lost it. I lost it. I was like, I felt lost. It was uh, very sad and very lost and very, what's the word I want to say? 
uh, just, just sad <laughs> because I knew that also I knew, quote unquote, with the doctors had said that I'd have 90 days to live. So now I was alone in the last 90 days of my life. I was going to pass by myself, be on my own. Uh, but the truth is that as I lost all those points of references, so did my cancer. And as everything else changed around me, I was obliged to change. And as I was obliged to change and kind of like, like accidentally, because I had nothing to do and nowhere to go, I started practicing four and five hours a day yoga. And I started paying attention and doing two hours or three hours of what food I'm going to cook and how it's organic and what I'm eating and everything, right? Everything was around what I eat, how I exercise, uh, what healers I would see, etc. So now I became a ray because I lost the other ray. I became a ray that was um in some ways an ascetic because i didn't have friends anymore right i, I would meet some people but i was basically 99.9 .9 of the time alone i mean that was a bigger truth other than teaching that was a bigger truth anyway in my life uh some of you friends have visited me at my place those were the times that i had people over when we do some groups but generally speaking um, that transition from the ray in Greece with cancer, transition to a more monastic ray in the United States, where practice, study, uh, food, breathing, meditating, uh, basically by definition had taken place, were, had become my life. By definition, there was no one there. I would just sit and meditate for, in the evenings, I was alone in silence. Um, so, there's something to be said here. And, you know, I'm looking back, you know, I can really remember that it was really difficult. I can remember, and I'll say it to you guys, because I feel you, we've, we've been through a lot together already. And I've seen you transition and tra transform and shift and change. And um, I did a lot of crying. I did a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of crying, <laughs> a lot of wailing. <laughs> it's just like, how am I losing everything? How am I losing everything? And it was that everything, like, listen to this. And I send so much compassion to that Ray, to that 40-year-old guy who left his two-year-old son. Uh, and if I hadn't, if I hadn't, I wouldn't be here today. Nor Jason, 19 years old, this awesome, tall guy would be here today. So there's this component. It's just like, when we talk about change, tell your narrator have that conversation and the more we're able to tell a narrator things the more we're really on the path because our narrator is telling us things all the time yet we think that that is our inner thought so when i'm thinking about what i don't like and what i need to change or what it needs to happen uh what upsets me 90 percent of the time the voice we're hearing is the narrator's voice and I know this is one of the hardest things to discern, the hardest things to clarify within. And I'm going to say this. Yes, this voice is you, too. This voice, too, is also you. Um, but it's not the only, and it shouldn't be the master voice. There is a voice that is quieter. You know, we all know, I've shared with you guys, the word shaman means the knower. So there's this other voice that is a knowing voice. So it doesn't articulate with so many words because it just knows. So it transmits the knowing. It transmits the fact that it's all here. You are enlightened now. You are with God now. You Everything is perfect right now as you are. And I know I've heard these words and I was saying, you, I'm going to raise my hand at this, wherever at the workshop I was with, Say Robert Thurman, the great philosopher from Columbia University, and I would be like, "No, everything is not in my life. <laughs> I don't have my friends. I don't have this." But feel into it. There is a voice that knows because that is why we are alive. What is the spark of life and electricity within us is God, and is that deeper self, the real, true self, the higher self, if we want to call it that, that is always present. And always can smile because the smile only needs to, you know, look at your dog and you know everything is there. Look at these birds outside and everything is there. Look at, look at, look at your a friend of yours and everything is right here. We don't need anything else. So I like it. I think that Dharma talks. Dharma talks. You and, and correct me if I'm wrong. But I think at Dharma talks, you're allowed to say anything philosophical. So about spirituality, 
<laughs> so, so I just want you to keep that in mind, that and, and in literally in mind, uh, and the fact that because I know that most of you are trained and may have given a, one or two or a hundred sessions to people, uh, notice that most people that means us too. Uh, would rather things change, but they don't want to change. And that just never happens because I can't change who my neighbors are. I can't change who my boss is. I can't change who my mom is. I can't change who my, I can't change people. Uh, and the only thing I could do is change how I perceive of it. And if there's moments that I decide, you know what, this is not my neighborhood. I'm changing because I'm not in, in, a, in a deep place in myself. I'll feel unhappy. I'm going to leave the neighborhood. You know what? This boss is like not, this is not jiving. My soul is suffering. I'm going to leave the boss. I'm going to have to walk. I'm going to have to make decisions. And I'm not saying I've used the word leave twice. Maybe there is some place I know, let me rephrase it, that I know will be so much better for me. I will go to that place. Maybe there's a job that I feel is so much better for me. I will try to get that job, right? So I will try to evolve constantly to catch up with change. And also, yeah, evolve to catch up with change. But that's the thing, you know, that's the tricky, that's the tricky business. So the only person holding us back from evolving, you guys know who it is, right? It's me, it's us, it's our own self, it's our own self. And, and I'll say to this, and I think I'm gonna to try to move into another direction with the conversation with the, with the, the Dharma talk. I'm gonna say that we are establishing, we have a friend here that, ha that has a one and a half year old Bridget, you met him, Aurelius. Uh, and so we met Aurelius when he was six months. Now he's a year and a half. And it's really amazing to watch the transition at this age, <clears throat> the transition of consciousness, how consciousness is being downloaded and is more and more Aurelius, this baby that was wah, 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 that we saw a little bit in the corner. Now it's more and more like coming forward and you could see him and he's now walking around talking to us. He's like, la, 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 la. He's not forming words yet, but he talks a lot. <laughs> I hope that's not how you guys hear me. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Sometimes, okay, I'll take that. <laughs> That's why I appreciate, you know, we say thank you. <laughs> and if you love me as much as I love Aurelius, we're all set. And I know you do. <laughs> so the thing is that we establish a rhythm, a biorhythm, a biochemical rhythm of emotions. By the time we're eight years old, there's moments that we get <gasps> scared or there's moments we get <sighs> excited. And there is this like all be in between and that kind of like what happens along with our mother, our parents' personality and where we live and events that happen to unfold and the rhythm, rhythm of things or non-rhythm of things, whatever it is, there's a pattern that is imprinted in our nervous system. It's imprinted in our cells and, and they're on, it builds up from cells to endocrine system to internal organs to nervous system, etc. And why did I say, and let me just be specific, because I always like to be very specific and not philosophical. Uh, when I say it's imprinted in our cells, our cells, as small, as tiny as they are, they each have something like, I have to look it up, but they have something like thousands of what are called uh, receptors, like little mouths. So when I eat something, my vitamin C, when all my, all my, uh, all my important elements that I have to take in my, my body to be able to be healthy, all those, I eat it, I chew it, it goes to my stomach, it's breaking down, it goes to my blood, my, blows, my blood goes to all my cells. Now my cells are eating, hence I am here and I'm alive. All these like three trillion cells are vibrating and I'm alive. So what I fed my cells, what we feed our, 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 our cells, which is who we are in the smallest part of us, who really, what we're built of is the food. But even more importantly, it's all the emotions that we go through the day. Because when I get 
really happy, I have endorphins. And, and when I get really angry, I have uh, adrenaline. And when I get really confused and, and anxiety, I have cortisol. So all these are secreted in the blood flow, feed the cells. The cells, depending on what you feed them, create the receptors because it's not like our mouth that we can eat almost everything if we cut it small enough. The receptors have a specific molecular structure shape that will take in the specific structure and shape of vitamin C, vitamin D. It has to be, it has to fit. So from one year from zero to pattern, and we're telling ourselves what we usually eat and when we eat it. In winter, you know, you have fall, winter, spring, summer, fall, winter, spring. And through all those times, we're eating all the food, but you're also experiencing all these emotions. Some, that we, some emotions that we came with are predispositions of our personality because of our, the moment we were born under the stars. And then a lot of it also is our parents and the people that we see around us make us feel different things. And those emotions, as we feel them, go to the blood flow, feed our body. And by eight years old, we have built a, a body of these cells at the time. And these cells like this menu. And that's who I identify with. I, I go, it's me. It's me. Or when I say, when we all say, it's me, I'm talking to you, but I'm pointing to a body really. So we really identify with this body, right? We actually kind of like, if we all agree, it's like almost like, yeah, we all agree is that this is who Ray is. We have a, a new woodpecker in town. So, but the idea is that the body is a part of who I am uh, and where my soul is happening to live in right now as a tenant for a moment. So what happens is we have these cells and the cells keep on perpetuating these rhythms and these wants and these needs and these yearnings and these ideas and these um, projections and these uh, dreams or, or what we consider a nightmare, what we consider a dream. They constitute our physio the physiology of our personality. And they are essentially uh, dictating what our personality and our perception of reality is. We have no, while we think we have values, right? Have you built in values? You've had relationships, you've been hurt, you've studied, you've like been through different things in your life to come to some conclusions of what is right and what is wrong, what should be valued and put up in a pedestal, what should be thrown out. All oh, these are values and the ways we see the world. All of those are, first of all, described and live in our body as a biochemical reality. Like I can't have a thought if the biochemistry doesn't create it. Even thought itself is a spark of electricity in the brain. It's a synapsis. It's two neural pathways meeting together, and they touch, and there's a bzzz, And I'm like, I got it. I have an idea. You know, it's just like we're thinking chemically, we're thinking electrically. So the physiology of the body doesn't want anything to change, but enters in the player, which is the higher self. In the Bhagavad Gita, it talks about the self with a capital S or the self with a lowercase s. And here I'll say it's like the, our, our, who our roommate is, is like Ray, the ego. And I want to say in Greek, ego means is, is the pronunciation is ego, and it means I, it means myself. So there's two remains, is myself and my spirit, who I am through the centuries, who I come back over and over again to come into new bodies. And then when I come into a new body, I create a new personality that comes with that body, with a predisposition of the astrology when I'm born, to where I was born, the culture, to the language, to all the then events that happened to me, to, to my surroundings. Our surroundings determine who we are. And I, and I think that really is just one of the most important things to realize. So our surroundings, so if I were born and I was put in a monastery, I would be a very different person. You would see the color of something of my personality behind. You know, would 
still keep something of my voice, something of my way. But if I was in a monastery all my life, I would have very different ideas. I would be doing a different job. I would be talking about different things. The world would be a different world for me. So the big, the big game changer is when I realize that it's in my body, that I'm holding the patterns. And then if I change these things in the reality of my body, my chemistry is going to change. My thought is going to change. My perception is going to change. So will all my choices and what I think of the world. So, yeah, let's change everyone that bothers us. Let's change everything that not is not congruent with what we want it to be. But let's not go out and tell them to change. The idea of coming back into yoga is to dive into making that change inside. So when you look back again at that neighbor, you know, at one point it was like, for an example, let's say that there was a neighbor that was really arrogant and was always short and never really sat to say more than good morning. You know, and there was a neighbor that was an ass for years. But then... I found out that that neighbor lost his wife three years ago. Now that neighbor is not an ass. Now our neighbor is an amazing person that unfortunately has been really hurt. And when I look at that neighbor now, I'm not pissy and I'm not, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm better than him and da, 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 he's not good. But rather I look at the neighbor and I say, oh, my God, that's a brave person that's still moving through life. No matter what happened, he's still at it good for him. So life, life is all perception for everything, for everything you don't like. And I know because there's things I still don't like. <laughs> it goes with being in a body. And so everything you don't like, notice if you can, and especially because I'm looking at you guys and you're all like graduates from the Jaguar path, uh, most of you, I'm going to say, yeah, eight out of nine people here. Um, uh, what is the change that you could do? It's like, so instead of like focusing, it's also, what is the change? And the big part of the change can start with fasting, changing our food, can start with leaving and retreating in a new place. I mean, Chinese medicine says, visit a new, once a year, visit a place you've never been to for at least a week. And it changes your whole immune system. So I'd say, you know, as, as things open up also, because I know we've all been, in, in a place of a lockdown. Um, but even in lockdown, that could have been a new place for all of us. It's like paint the room and be in this new room. Allow the change to happen within you and clear it out through the practices of yoga. Clear it out through Tai Chi. Whatever it is that helped you from what we're teaching or there's other things out there too, like dancing also. Whatever it is to use to move it out of the body. When we change, there's a period that we go through dis-ease. We go through uh, resistance. There's this resistant, inner resistance to change. So again, I'm going to just say, I'm going to try to say this sentence and maybe turn it or maybe uh, open it up for a question. Um, If there's anything that bothers you, because I really love all you guys and I don't want you to be bothered, <laughs> take a moment and really meditate on what I shared today and really just look at it, that person, that situation and say, okay, that, that, really, that really bothers me. That person really bothers me. I really don't like this person and I get upset. And take a moment and take a step back and breathe as if you're breathing in front of this person. Feel that they're right in front of you. And see this person and say, this person could be me. And see this person and say, this person could have suffered a lot to arrive at this place to become such a uh, not likable person. And see as a healer, can you send love and energy to them? And then see what it is that you can change that changes your reality and relationship to them. It could be, wow, that person is my boss or forever, and I'm changing this. I'm, I'm like, they obviously have been hurt. They obviously are not lovable to other people. And I'm just going to look at this person as myself, and I'm going to send them love. 
but I still don't want to go Monday morning to work and have this person in front of me. The healthy and powerful thing is to say, okay, Monday morning, I'm going to give in my resignation and I'm going to find a job to a place where I go and I feel really good. I feel really good because again, it's like the way the setup is, it's like I'm looking outside and I think that the problem is with the world. And if I could tell the world how it is, I would live in a better world. But the thing is that we're all telling the world, we're all voting here. And everything that's happening from Corona to wars, to births and people falling in love, everything, everything is happening is because we have all voted. Because every single one of us in the screen, all nine of us have casted our vote and we're part of it. So it's not like we are not a part of what we don't like. We're a big part of what we don't like. And that's really the tricky part of like, and, and really to just look into and say, I assume a responsibility. And by saying that alone, a lot of things change. By saying that alone, a lot of things change. With that comes a maturity, what we call a spiritual maturity. There's two things that characterize spiritual maturity is to assume response first and foremost. The one I hated the most <laughs> forever, first and foremost, to assume responsibility for your own emotions. So when I am angry, it's not this neighbor that is a problem. It's like I need to deal something with my anger. The neighbor is actually uh, is a friend. He's giving me a gift. He's pointing out to me something that I haven't worked on yet. There's a part of me that still has resistance even saying this. I know this to be a, a fact. It's an absolute fact. And, and, and if you bring in that other voice and have humor, because we can't really, I, I don't, I don't like, I'm not strict and I don't like people that become too rigid. And you see our yoga, right? And, and even our teachings, we're going to laugh. We're going to have time to be human and to relax. A yoga, we're going to have time to catch our breath and slow down. It doesn't all have to be today and it doesn't have to be rigid. It doesn't work for most of the people. For most people, it doesn't work that way. But allow yourself then with humor to be the change you want to see in the world by accepting those things that you don't like and and, and or making changes because it's that's the other funny thing it's just like you see people in unhappy relationships and they're in an unhappy relationship for 47 years and for 47 years they they love saying you know ah oh, my wife ah <laughs> my whatever it is right they're like we stay in these in these situations circumstances while we're saying we don't like them and we're still choosing to be in them so choices uh, courage staying with whatever may come up with which can be and will be a little bit of uh, disease and plenty of uh, resistance and hummingbird reminds us that on the other side that we persevere nectar is a waiting for our cells to happen and that like for me you know spiritual growth you know we our cells die and are reborn for anything from seven days to seven years like our hair Nails, like seven days, those cells are, are born and died. That's why hair grows and we cut it and it grows. Right? Our bones, though, the, the most dense part in the center of our body, take about seven years. So every seven years, we live in a brand new body that we didn't have before. Did you guys know that? I still say it for the last 15 years that I've known it and teach it. It's just like, I still find it fascinating because I, I still think it's me, but it's not me. These are other bones. These are new. This is a new skin. These are new eyes, these are new teeth. These are new hands. It's like, this is not me. Yet everything in my mind wants everything to be the same. Uh, allow for this uh, seven year period to happen in yoga practices and shamanic practices and after seven years, you know, what? along with the practices, you've changed the cells because they actually naturally do change. And you are now more and more feeding through the practice of yoga, through the practice of better eating or meditating, the chemi chemistry you're feeding your body through that time and that period is different food. So you're raising a new self. You're really literally raising yourself after seven years of cycle. And I'm in my 17th, so I'm two times around. I've changed all my cells. 
And thank God the cells died, right? Because there was a lot of cancerous cells that were not dying. They were actually multiplying. But now they started dying. Then they started dying along with the other ones, with all previous ideas, along with all that that I had lost. Because I lost my friends. I lost my, my reality. And along with that reality, I lost the reality of being a person with cancer. So there is a self inside, and I'm going to open it to questions. We have only nine minutes. So I'm going to say there's a part of the self, the higher self, they can actually, because that higher self is already enlightened, they can actually foresee a better way of being. So if there's something that you see inside you and you can take a moment and say, well, this is how I wanted, I want to be, write it down. And along with writing it down, offer it a practice as a prayer a prayer itself or a sun salutation or a minute of meditation or an hour of meditation, whatever you want and works for you, but offer a practice that goes with that intention and you will simply see it come into fruition. And again, it might take seven days or seven months or some of it may take seven years, but when we really put our minds to it and our awakened higher self, those changes are going to happen because change is the only thing that is certain. Okay. Any questions, guys, or comments? Anything anyone would like to add or, or subtract, maybe? <laughs> Anything. It's so, so nice to see you guys. Yes. Is that a question, Dila? Um, I don't have a question, but I just do want to make an observation that, or a comment that um, I feel like it may be seven years for me to fully, well, to embody in the way I want or expect to embody a lot of the shamanic practices. Um, as much as I've steeped myself in them, I can sense, you know, just feeling still very new, feeling like a, like a baby, <laughs> like, or like, new just yeah a toddler <laughs> yeah toddler kind of like that yeah mm -hmm. clunky a little toddling a little a little clunky <laughs> um so i think yeah giving space for this even possibility that it could be up to seven years or something thereof um yeah helps me kind of just drop in slower in my expectations Awesome. Awesome. And let me say this, that can help you also, if you have any impatience for those seven years to pass. First of all, the seven years will pass very quickly. <laughs> Unfortunately, they do. <laughs> they just go, <laughs> what? I, 57 on the June 21st. Uh, but also the other part of it is that, and I'll say this to you guys, it's like, you realize that the part of the ego, your personality, is awesome. And, and you just begin to have a different conversation. Because like I'm here 18 years later, like 16 of which working with the shamans, 10, a good decade, a good 12 years, I want to say, with having all the initiations and knowing all the tools and really living a life where I don't talk, think, or practice anything else. There's yoga. Uh, martial arts, uh, shamanism. It's like, this is my entire life, right? And it's been over 12 years that I'm a teacher also of all this. And, uh, um, I, and I'll tell you something that um, Manuel told me when he was 77. And he said, you're always a beginner. You're always a beginner. And that's where you want to be because there's just such a sweetness to it. Like you're like, you're like a baby and you have that like, Oh my God, it's a brand new life. It's a brand new life. So there's something that's really enjoyable. There's no, you know, the only thing that really kind of like sits in place, kind of sits in place, is that that I've shared with you guys several times when I was asking a hundred questions to Sebastian and he was like, he couldn't take my question. He was like, hermanito, it's all here right now. It's like, look, look, we were looking at the sacred valley, like, look. It's here. There's nothing to be questioned, you know, and, that, and that's the ego in the narrator. I want to question. I want to have a style. I want to do this. I want to do that. In the meantime, all of enlightenment, you know, God, everything is right here. The angels are here. Every, everything is right here right now. And I feel that that just kind of like slides in or has for me uh, in the last few years. 
um, while at the same time, there's many things that are not in place, like my car is not here, nor my house that several of you had come, and all my things, nothing is here, and I'm like, no, nothing is here. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> uh, so we live between two worlds. You know, becoming a shaman means that you walk with one foot on one side of the veil and the other foot on the other side of the veil. And both of them love each other because the full long going to the other side of the veil is going to happen when, uh, when I'm done. The beauty of this side of the veil is almost like, it's almost like my suffering or the self-inflicted suffering of what I don't like. Self-inflicted suffering when I say I don't like this, I don't like this, and I'm still not doing anything about it. It's like, I'm like but that's nice too because it's how, what we go through. It's our life itself, right? It's just like there's a sweetness to it. Bridget, um, yeah, when you were talking about you know uh, people and being able to turn you know annoyance into compassion, it's. Um, it's so interesting because I was thinking about someone not not my boss, <laughs> because after two weeks at that job, I realized it was not for me and I just nipped it in the bud. But um, but, you know, for someone else and I was thinking and, and of course, everything that bothers me about that person is a character a trait that I have exhibited at some point in my life. You know, um, they're too talkative. <laughs> me saying that. No. <laughs> or you know spend too much money or you know i mean i'm thinking about the same person or you know they uh they just seem so naive and i'm like well i was like that once i was really naive i used to think i was just realizing while you were talking about all of this i used to when when i got my first checkbook i was writing checks and i didn't realize it was related to my bank account i just thought it was like endless money like i just like someone gives you a checkbook when you turn 21 i didn't realize <laughs> I mean, that's how stupid I was. I just want you to understand that at some point I was that person. And so I <laughs> with other people. I, was I did the person. same. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but now we know better. <laughs> anyway, but Accumulated silly amounts of debt. <laughs> but now it's like, you know, you, you spot it, you got it. So it's like a lot of times I have to see, I have to really funnel exactly what it is about that person that I find so annoying and nine times out of 10, I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I used to be like that, or I'm like that now, or that's a part of myself that I don't want to look at. And then I feel and then I feel close to them. I don't feel like, you know, yeah, or not out of balance anymore. Thank you. That's awesome. It's right on. It's right on. And I think it's to bring it home is like, so how do I walk if I'm a shaman in the modern world? And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a householder, right? I'm not in any cave. And I want to be a householder. I love my, my wife. I love me. I, I love my son. I'm so happy my son has come here. And now I have to cook for him. I have to go shopping. I have like 100 new things that I didn't have to do. Now I have to. And I love it. Uh, because that's who we are, right? Our, these new points of references that we do cherish and we do want. Uh, so I think, again, as we walk with both feet, with one foot on one side of the veil and the other on the other side of the veil, we take life with humor and we walk through a day um, paying attention and honoring what is love and what is compassion and what keeps our cool and our chemistry in that higher frequency constantly. I have, uh, let me see if I still have this here. I probably do not. Um, I'll, just, I'll just say one uh, one phrase of Haviz, and some of you may, may know this poem, I may have read it to you at other times. Uh, we have not come here to take prisoners. We have not come here to take prisoners. We have come here to surrender to our joy and freedom and light. Um, so may we all be free and may we walk as love. And remember that everything that happens, we have a choice to either remain open as love or closed down in dysfunction. There's no in between. And I have discovered that staying open as love, as hugely almost impossible that it seemed, once I started doing it, I realized that that, that itself was the power of choice. That itself was a power of, of will. 
of my own will. Anything else before that, even when I hated and I thought it was my choice not to like something, it wasn't. I was a prisoner of dislike because now I can coexist with any person from any country and any language spoken with any person from any religion. Um, and generally speaking, when things are not where my body or my chemistry and my work uh, and integrity wants me to be, then I simply continue to smile and bow as I walk away. And I keep myself in that check and in that space of much closer always to a place of ecstasy or a place of really, of gratitude, I should say. Gratitude and appreciation. Um, and days that I can't bring it up, and there are days that I can't bring it up. So don't say, well, one day I'm really pissed and it's like, oh, I'll break and do it, but I can't. That's not true. Those days I can't bring it up and I can be upset, right? Um, I, I don't give the microphone to the narrator. <laughs> so I might be a little crouchy one day because I had, let's say we celebrated with champagne, someone that got married yesterday and that was awesome. And so we had some champagne, but my liver today is pounding and accidentally because we were visiting their coffee was too strong. So now I'm like, uh, my nervous system is like this. And then I found out that, you know, we lost the car that we had to give the car back to the dealer and we had to pay $10,000 on top of that. Uh, along with the other 40 that I already gotten, right? This is like, and I look back and I don't care. <laughs> I really don't care. <laughs> so, but the moment is that these things are happening because in life things do happen and not always either to our favor or what we really wish them to be. Don't give the microphone to the narrator and, and, and explain to the self that there's things that are bigger than that and more important and this shall pass too. And allow for love to flow through you because it's the best, 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 best ever medicine. Oh. So love and humor, 603, 803 at your place. I'll respect your time, especially see them later for you guys. Thank you so much. I hope this is something you enjoyed. I always look forward to it. Oh, two things not to forget. We're starting the uh, Shaman Summit, the Andean Summon Summit, at July 12th to 16th. I don't know, a lot of you have registered. I'm not sure that every one of you that's here has registered yet. Uh, from $800, it's only $300 join. Some of that money goes directly to them for sure. And we're really so grateful to have them and so grateful to be able to put this together because it was really nearly impossible. Uh, but yet with the help of the friends there and with Wilbert and everything, we're, we're making it happen. Uh, please, if you do come, invite some friends. This year's uh, Jaguar Path starting October is starting in a very different way uh, than any other time. And we really count on you bringing in friends, letting people know this is the time that people need to have that point of reference that we're talking about earlier to be Mother Earth, because most of the dis-ease is happening because people have lost the connection with nature itself. So they've lost the connection with their own nature. And we are going to talk a lot about nature, about Aini, Munai. We, you will have the opportunity to see all these people if you haven't, all my teachers. And I'm like deeply moved and super, super enthusiastic. And look for an email. I will send you the email uh, when... Uh, this is published, the video I made on uh, talking about flow. Uh, I will definitely send it out to you guys so you can see it too. All right. Thank you so much. Namaste. Lots of love to all of you. May you have a happy and fun day for the rest of the day and the evening. Thank you. Hope you chai. Hope you chai. Any comments or ideas, please shoot me an email. Lots of love to all. Thank you. Good night.